Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth session of the Remote Teaching and Learning Analytics web series hosted by Utah State University and co-sponsored by the Center for Student Analytics and the Office of Empowering Teaching and Excellence. My name is Braden Ross. I'm a data scientist at the Center for Student Analytics at Utah State. Linked below are some pages you can check out some of my previous work that I've done. So, as I mentioned, this is the fourth session in this web series. You are more than welcome to watch the previous sessions that have been done. Uh, I'll share the link to see those later on in the uh, presentation. There will be future sessions announced, and those will also be uh, stored on the web link that I'll share later on. So this fourth session is going to be focused on promptness and grading. And if you watched any of the previous sessions uh, that we've done, you'll know that this webinar series is focused on sharing some of the insights and analytical uh, details that we've gained at the Center for Student Analytics, uh, examining the online space. And we really want to share these insights with you as instructors to help you perform the best you possibly can in the online environment. Uh, obviously, because we're in a unique situation, most people are online only with social distancing and COVID-19. So this webinar series is really going to be focused on helping you as instructors be uh, as effective as possible in the online learning environment. So uh, the session that I did last week was focused on feedback and the tonality of feedback that students receive and how important that is and what effects it can have. This week I'm going to focus on promptness of feedback, so how quickly students receive that feedback uh, specifically in the form of grades and other uh, input that the instructors can have for students' assignments. So obviously students place an incredibly high value on the feedback that they receive. It's a method for them to understand where they're at and how they're doing in the course and changing their trajectory is uh, something that they try and do based off of that information. So. Obviously, in-class feedback is unavailable right now with social distancing and online-only situations, so there's not the opportunity to get that verbal confirmation uh, in class by asking a question that, you know, the student's doing well or being able to stop by and ask an instructor how a student is doing or anything to that effect. And so right now where students don't really have that face-to-face -face contact or that availability of instructors to go and seek them out, they need to know now more than ever how they're performing and just where they stand in the course structure. So obviously students are going to be looking for even more prompt feedback, maybe more so than they would normally in the face-to-face -face environment. Uh, just to give you an example of how important feedback is and how important prompt feedback is to students, in my undergraduate years at Southern Utah University, one of the main objectives over the course of two years for the Student Association was passing a requirement for all instructors campus-wide to be required to have midterm grades posted every semester at midterm and no later. And that requirement was actually passed and has been an incredibly powerful thing for all students involved and uh, had really great effects. So obviously you can see if it's the focus of you know, a given student association for the better part of two years, then that's something that they place very high value on. So let's just talk about how prompt is prompt because obviously you know, it may vary from assignment to assignment, but on a general basis, there's one thing that I really want to kind of drive home here for you, and that is feedback should be usable by the student. That's a quote from a paper that I uh, cited in my last presentation, and that has a couple of meanings. Feedback obviously should be usable in the sense that it's uh, good information for the student, it details things in the assignment that the student can use uh, for the next assignment. 
it's uh, topical, it has to do with the course material that's coming up. So there's that sense, and then the sense uh, that we're going to focus on this week is the comment should be usable by the student and the grade should be usable by the student in a reasonable time frame. Because obviously if feedback or a grade is given in an inefficient time frame, students really don't have the opportunity to change their trajectory and make the necessary adjustments in their coursework to be able to utilize that information effectively. So students, for the most part, research shows that they prefer a time frame that they can remember the work that they did. And that obviously makes sense to a lot of us. A survey conducted in a research paper actually showed that the majority of students prefer feedback within one week of a submission. So from the time of submission, uh, one week after that is the optimal time frame that most students prefer to have that feedback in. And that's across all years, so it doesn't change from being a freshman to a junior to a senior. Uh, any year, most students in that study showed that they preferred that time frame as well. So now that we've addressed kind of the scenario and what we're going to be looking at, I'd like to talk about uh, some of the things that we've gained from insights into grade times at higher education universities and what effects those can have. So we really didn't want to necessarily at first tie grade time to any one outcome. Uh, we didn't want to say that grade time directly correlated with X, Y, or Z. We really wanted to try and analyze and visualize information to try and paint a picture for instructors so that we could share this information and have them see, oh, okay, so these are the types of trends that we should be seeing, or if our class falls under this category of characteristics, then we should be trying to uh, utilize these grading practices. And, you know, you kind of get the idea. And so we analyze grade time across all courses and disciplines at a higher education university. And we wanted to identify more levels of detail past just grade time. So grade time obviously in this case is the time between submission and grade. And then below that we wanted to kind of dig down deeper and see if we could paint a bigger picture with additional levels of detail that had to do with grades. So we examined three specifically. So obviously average grade time and then we examined date of first grade entered because, like I said in the example before, that's incredibly important to students to know where they stand early on or at least some point before the end part of a semester. And finally, number of assignments submitted. So you'll see why we included all of those in this next slide where I'll show you the visualization here. So what we have here is the visualization that was created to share with instructors and departments to help them visualize what kinds of trends grade time has within it and what these additional levels of detail provide. So the orange dots there on the top are the date of the first grade entered. You can see that that right side axis over here that shows the, the first date entered. And then the blue columns here are the average grade time in days. So each individual column here is a course for a given semester. And so you have that two-pronged graph on the top, and then what really makes this graph important and informative is that bottom section with the green trend line. And what that shows is the number of assignments submitted. So for instance, if I'm in a course that has 15 assignments over the course of the semester, and I have, you know, uh, it may, let's say maybe it's a small class and I have three students, uh, then obviously it would be 45 assignments submitted over the given semester. So taking a look at this graph, we've sorted it in descending order for grade time. And so you see that trend line and it's trending downward. And this department is actually doing pretty well overall for grade time. You can see that most of them are centered towards the right hand side. And so most of them don't really have too long of a grade time between submission and grade, which is great. That's what we love to see. And you also see that for the most part, most of these first grade entered 
uh, points are centered towards the lower half of this graph, which is good. Obviously, the, the ones that we want to identify and address are these ones up here in the left-hand side because, you know, in a spring semester, we're getting pretty close to when the semester ends. So if the first grade entered is until, isn't until the 1st of April, then that's something that probably isn't helping students understand where they stand. Now, what really drives this home for instructors when we talk about it is we put this additional trend line on here to say we want to see this um, kind of opposite axis effect where you have this decreasing trend for grade time and opposite that we want to see an increasing trend for assignments submitted. So you can see that the courses with the lowest average grade time have the most number of assignments submitted. And that's really what we love to see and what we've identified is impacting students positively. Because if students are submitting frequent work, they need frequent feedback and they need frequent identification of how they're doing in the course as far as grades go to make adjustments, to give them time to reflect. And so these courses are doing incredibly well with this. They're having lots of uh, assignment submissions, but they're grading them quickly. These are what the courses that we like to see and what we really understand impacts students well. And then you might ask yourself, well, why are there so few assignments over here and why are there so such high grade times? Well, if we look at the department here, it's engineering, tech, and construction management. So more than likely what these courses have as far as coursework are a few semester long projects or maybe month to month projects that are being done by the students. And so these, and that's what we can see down here. I mean, there's relatively uh, few assignments compared to this center of the, this portion of the graph. And so we can deduce that maybe these uh, are large projects that take a long time to grade, they take a long time to do. So this all comes within the phrasing of, of the right context, because we want to be sure that, you know, we're not uh, penalizing or asking these instructors, why is your grade time so high? We can probably gather that these are some big projects students are working on that take a little bit more time to grade. So we've looked at an example of what a, a good trend looks like for a department. And then looking at this graph here, we obviously have sorted the data the same in a decreasing fashion. And so overall average grade time over here to the right, they're doing okay. Obviously you can see the scaling is a little different. So, uh, you know, most people are around 10 days between its submission and grade. So that's, that's all right. What we really want to identify and address is this portion of the graph down here. So, this is showing that for this department, students are submitting frequent work and for some courses that students are taking in this uh, discipline, they're not receiving frequent feedback. And while the first grade entered looks okay for this course, there's you know 600 plus assignments that are being submitted for this instructor and the instructor is taking on average about 25 days to respond. So this is an area that when we show instructors this information, they kind of say to themselves, well, how can students be expected to, you know, perform well if they don't understand where they're at or that they're getting feedback on their assignments? And that's the question that we want instructors to ask is to say, you know, well, how, how can students be uh, better served as far as grades go? Can, is, can I help them understand earlier on where they stand, even if it's just a, a quick grade at the beginning of a semester for a basic assignment. We've shown through research that that actually helps, even if it's a routine assignment like a get to know you quiz. Uh, students really respond well to having early grades and setting that pattern of frequent feedback throughout the semester. So now that you've seen kind of the, the overall uh, data that we've gathered and kind of the picture that we've painted, I want to talk about the bigger picture impact that these practices have on students. Because when we're having this discussion with instructors, they think, well, 
this is only going to be, you know, contained within my classroom and I can change my practices and it'll help students here. But other than that, really, you know, I, I don't know that it has any effects. Well, actually, we've seen that it does. And grade time actually has unseen impacts further on in the student's experience. When we did a larger analysis and examination into persistence at higher education universities, we actually found that average grade time was significant and it was impactful on a student's likelihood to persist. So if a student historically in their career at a higher education university has had classes with low average grade times, meaning they're getting feedback much more frequently, then it actually increases their likelihood of persistence at the university. And that's incredibly powerful to understand, to share with you as instructors to say, you know, your grade practices not only impact students' performance in your given class, they actually per, uh, impact the performance of the student at the university as a whole. That really puts it into perspective to say, oh, okay, you know, by facilitating the student's uh, ability to change their trajectory, to identify areas that they can improve on, to give them time to improve on those things, it will actually have a lasting impact on the student throughout their time at the university. So I really want to share that with you and to have you understand that these things will have an impact further beyond, you know, when the student leaves your classroom. So now that we've talked about all that, I'd like to share a few uh, suggestions for some effective grading strategies. And researchers have uh, suggested these and, and shown that they have lasting impacts and they can really make grading efficient. So pre-semester calendaring can be an incredibly powerful tool to use for instructors and also for students. So as instructors, you might find yourselves uh, getting swamped right now with trying to construct online courses, trying to keep up with student questions, trying to uh, figure out all the tech issues that you might have with recording lectures, whatever it may be. And what comes along with that is maybe a, a swamped feeling of, you know, I have to grade all these papers. I, I, I can't, you know, I can't find time to do all these things. But what pre-semestering, pre-semester calendaring does is it gives you as the instructor an opportunity to maybe change your course uh, coursework schedule to say, you know, historically I've had assignments due on maybe Wednesday. If I change that to Friday and then block out three hours Saturday morning every morning, then I have a set grading time. Students have a little more time to complete the assignments and I'm not feeling swamped all the time with grades. And that's actually been shown to be an incredibly effective practice, not only for students, but also for instructors. It helps you really not be overwhelmed at one time in the semester with grades. Secondly is rubric grading. And we'll talk a, a lot more about this in a later session of this web series. But rubric grading can be an incredibly powerful practice for instructors to make their grading much more efficient. Because if you're constructing a rubric based on an assignment, you're detailing for students exactly what they should be trying to accomplish, what they need to include, and then thereby doing so, you as an instructor can then grade much more efficiently by looking for those things that students are required to do. Uh, we spoke with an instructor while we were sharing this information and they shared with us an experience. They inherited a course that had a very large uh, paper in the coursework and there was no rubric associated with it they just knew that the paper had always been done in the course and so when it came time for them to grade those papers that first uh, semester it took them an incredibly long time and it was very inefficient they couldn't figure out a, a good way to go through it uh, and really they were just kind of feeling like i said overwhelmed and so what they decided to do the next semester was construct a rubric based around that assignment to detail you know, what's required of the student, what they should include in each paragraph, uh, the characteristics of the paper. And what they found was that their grade time greatly decreased based off of using that rubric because they were able to quickly identify, okay, this student missed this specific portion of the rubric. I'm going to you know, write down my feedback and then move on to the next section. So that's been shown to be an incredibly effective practice and something that 
we'd really hope that you'd consider trying out in the future with your grading practices. And finally, we have the wonderful opportunity through technology of using dictation or speech to text. And what that does for you as an instructor is it gives you the opportunity to utilize that tech to put feedback down maybe faster than you can type. And you cut down your feedback time on every assignment through using this technology and it really adds up. You know, I'm sure anybody out there who is a fast typer, you can probably talk faster than you can type. And, you know, software like Word, uh, Google Docs, all of these things have dictation tools for you to be able to relatively quickly and accurately put down your thoughts and then share them with students. So these are, these are all practices that you're more than welcome to try and things that have been shown to be effective. Uh, obviously, when we're talking about you know efficient grading strategies and suggestions that instructors can use, I really want to you know, pound home that plus delta approach. If you've watched the previous webinar that I did, I talked about it a lot. And it's something that we in the Center for Student Analytics use quite a bit. And we ask ourselves two questions at the end of every project, uh, you know, or end of every quarter. Whatever we do, if we do something large, we always go through this process as a team. And we ask ourselves, ourselves what went well and what could be improved or changed. So as you're listening to this webinar series and you're identifying these practices and listening to this research, uh, keep in mind, you know, it's very pertinent to ask yourself these two questions uh, and then try new things. And then once that semester is done, ask yourself these two questions again. You know, what went well this semester? Did I grade things quickly? I used some new technology. Did it work well? Um, was my grade time decreased from what it was last semester? And then if you're asking yourself these questions and coming up with different answers, then maybe you can address what could be improved or changed. You know, do I need to stop using dictation because, you know, it, it doesn't maybe help my students as much as an audio recording would? Or is my grade time, uh, you know, too fast? Am I grading things inefficiently for good feedback for students. All these things can be phrased with this plus delta approach, and that'll continue to help you as instructors hone that grading practice that works for you. So that's all about, that's about all I have time for today. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to this webinar series and to uh, hear these things that we want to share with you as instructors. And most of all, we really just appreciate you and the work that you do. Obviously, this is an uncertain time. People are really working as hard as they can to cope with everything that's going on in the education environment and the personal environment as well. And so the work that you're doing is incredibly powerful and impactful. And so we thank you and we appreciate you. Uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask about the research that we've done or the data that we've shown, you can ask me those directly through LinkedIn or directly at my email. Uh, if anybody has any questions that I think are you know, pertinent to share with the group, I will definitely do so at the beginning of the next session. Uh, and I will definitely take the time personally to respond to any and all questions. Uh, finally, uh, like I said, you can look at the rest of the webinar series and go back and watch the previous sessions. Uh, at the link in red text there below. So usu.edu slash AIS slash analytics slash remote learning and all the future sessions will be posted there as well. So thank you again. I appreciate the work that you do and we'll see you next time.